by Harold Lamb. We're continuing the afterward. At the same time, the Asiatics had been losing their lines of racial groupings and had coalesced with the settlers from the West in new, set in new centers. Imperceptibly, centers of culture and activity were moving eastward. The flood of new coinage reduced the value of the Athenian drachma to half, and Athens ceased to be the commercial mistress of the Mediterranean, becoming less important than Rhodes off the coast of Asia. On that coast city, building went on apace and became almost modern in character. Pergamum rows over paved streets with marble facades of academies and public lounges, swimming pools, and open-air theaters. South of Pergamum, the successors raised mighty Antioch, founded by Antiochus along the side of a valley were three caravan routes. From the land of the two rivers came together. Antioch had a famous circus and gardens, especially in the grove called Daphne, named after the grotto of that famous oracle. In due time, Antioch served as a resort for tired Roman businessmen and as one of the earliest centers of the Nazarenes, followers of that strange faith of Christianity. Well, actually, there were Nazarenes before Christianity, but that's another point. These new cities, like the now celebrated Alexandria on the Nile, departed sharply from the old er, European plan of a huddle of streets built around a defense citadel and a single temple. As Athens had grown up around Acropolis, they were built for people to live in and learn, not simply for defense and the worship of a single god or of the pantheon. Rome itself, then growing up around its forum or marketplace, and its temple of Mars, sprawling over its seven hills, you know, the seven-headed beast in the book of Revelation, was not so modern in a plan as these Hellenistic metropolitan centers of Pergamum and Antioch, but they serve as models for Pompeii, with its, villa, with its villas and baths and parks. They had their central parks, their bowls and college stadiums, their international houses and public theaters, and medical dispensary, and medical dispensaries. Around them, a new social cosmos had been created that endured throughout the Roman Imperium and raised the Durer, laboring patriarchal Romans, to its higher standard of living. This culture near East, or Eurasia, invited Westerners to a life in sunlight upon fertile, sto upon fertile soil, wherein music enlivened leisure hours and far-extending caravan routes tempted settlers to wander on. The Hellenistic culture might stem from the Greeks, but the physical world of Eurasia had been opened up by Alexandros, whose communications stretched as far as India. Before then, except on the narrow Ionian coast, Westerners had entered the gates of Asia only as refugees or mercenaries. After Alexandros, the Westerners came as citizens, seeking land or opportunity. The human influx crowded shipping eastward across the blue Agean, <coughs> the blue Agean. It pressed through the new embarkment ports, seeking stages and animal transport, donkey, horse, or camel, to journey on towards Marrakan, or Babylon, or one of the thirteen Alexandrias. It was not a case of the course of empire take its way eastward, taking its way eastward, 
the road of humanity had opened up thither, Alexandros, to whom nothing had seemed impossible, had drawn the west after him bodily into the east, and there it stayed. Descendants of the Macedon, the, uh, descendants of the Macedonian settlers left their physical characteristics among the white Kafirs of the Hindikush, the Hindiku, and until very recently, the red banner of S Samarkand was supposed was supposed by the natives there to be that of Iskander, or Alexander the Great. Alexandros o Megas, uh, the caravan cities. These caravan cities, seaports, and centers of learning were not founded by Alexandros's caprice or whims, or the successors, and Doc grew mightily because it stood at the junction of trade routes. Seleucia, nearby or on the sea, was no pleasure resort of a Seleucid, a Seleucid but was necessary as a port to serve the increasing trade of Antioch. In following out of the route of Alexandros' journey, as this writer has done, one fact strikes the observer of all the consideration of his time, and immediately after, nothing visible survives today. While in the case of the elder cities like Babylon and Athens, much survives, or at least has been unearthed. Probably the Macedonian building was almost entirely in the prevalent clay brick or timber and has succumbed to time and weather in sites that were abandoned after the Macedonian withdrawal. In some localities, such as in the Taurus Range, are the Afghan hills, granite and limestone are and were available, and you would expect to find some remnants of construction there, but even the lighthouse at Alexandria on the Nile has vanished without a trace, and British archaeologists have not been able to identify with certainty the site of Alexandros's twelve memorial pillars on the bank of the river Betas. The explanation of this disappearance of the architectural remains may be the unusual but, perfect, but perfectly natural one. Well, what do you think it is, right? that where his cities flourished and grew. They were so overbuilt in more than two millenniums that all traces of earlier structures are buried under more modern work. Well, that and people take the bricks and do something else with them. We find that in Cairo and various places. Even the so-called sarcophagus of Alexandros is probably latter work most al almost alone, almost the greater monarch of the ancient world, Alexandros left no monument other than his intangible legacy of handiwork, of new opportunities and thoughts among those who lived after him. Authorities mention Alexandros, uh, oh, Alexandria, Egypt, Herat, Kabul, Kandahar, Ghazni, Afghanistan, Kojen, Turkestan, and Patala, India, as metropolitan centers founded by Alexandros that have endured until today, and there were unquestionably others. In contrast, Aga and Pella, the capitals of ancient Macedon, reveal only a few stone foundations today. Not that the Hellenistic monarchs and the successors did not build on a huge scale and raise individual monuments of the modern sk skyscraper type, but they had a purpose. The giant Pharos lighthouse at Alexandria marked the narrow port entrance to shipping as far as the horizon could be seen, and the Colossus of the expanding seaport of Rhodes served the same purpose. At this time, so greatly had travel increased, men began, men began to list such superstructures, calling them the seven wonders of the world. Those built before the Hellenistic age were mostly individual memorials, 
or tombs. The statue of Zeus at Olympia in Greece, the tomb of Mausolos, the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the pyramid tombs of the Nile, and the penthouse gardens of Babylon, were Samir Ramis may or may not have built for her comfort. Now, Zeus and various other, various other terms that people worshipped um, with, just like Yahweh, you don't have a Yahweh in the nature of the language, doesn't mean, you know, Father God or anything like that, but people definitely started considering Yahweh as such. Shipping expanded sharply to take care of the new traffic, especially in the more eastern points, Rhodes, Alexandria, Beirut, some of the trans Aegean liners could accommodate uh, could accommodate a thousand passengers. At least one of the sea lanes Alexandros had meant to explore was opened up by the Ptolemies, who established ocean trip ocean traffic around Arabia, trans shipping to Indian vessels at the Yemen. They also ran a canal from the Nile to the Red Sea and opened ports there, named after the first Ptolemy's mother, Arsinoe. Macedonian women had shared rather fully the lives of their men, and the women of the successors continued to do so, especially in Egypt, where the name of Cleopatra, Cleopatra, um, okay, what's the Egyptian? Cleopatra, something, um, became common in the reigning dynasty. This dynasty followed Egyptian custom and marrying brothers to sisters in the royal house. Now, one of the great things about some countries, like the country that I lived in, uh, that I live in, is that we don't have to follow custom like that. Well, I mean, most of America's history, there was forced marriage, but that's been done away with um, as being something that's legal. Same thing with... Uh, incest to that degree, but, um, the women of the new Eurasia had, had emancipated themselves from the seclusion of the elder Greek homes, wherein wives had remained household objects, with the sole privilege of bearing children. Well, it wasn't quite that bad, but um, some attempt was made to sail around Africa, as Alexandros had planned to reach ocean in the west, but the successors found, as Alexandros had found, that such sallies out of the settled Eurasian zone brought them among more primitive people. They inferred, as his scientists and had conjectured, that their sea captains had advanced close to the edges of the world. Actually, Alexandros' expeditions had not overrun the greater part of the habitable world. When Oikumene, as he must have known it, toward the end of his short life, but he had penetrated almost all the earth. Inhabited by people of any culture. <coughs> China, of course, remained remote and unknown. He failed only to reach the people along the Ganges and in Arabia and the scattered cities of the western Mediterranean, such as Carthage, Syracuse, or Gaddis. And he had been turned back in effort to reach these peoples only by mutiny and his death. Perhaps he discovered more about the far distant populations 
than we realize, and had hoped to reach the limits not out of the habitable earth, but out of that inhabited by intelligent humans. What he thought of the Latins, who were then confined to the Italian peninsula, is not known. Over the sea routes and caravan tracks, the rare products of the farther east, the spices, glass, silk, ivory, sugar, pearls, oil, and above all, gold, gave comfort to the immigrants and trade to the new cities. These precious things worked their way into the hands of ordinary citizens, and the women especially never gave up wanting them. In Roman times and in the medieval world, demand continued for the spices and luxuries of the East. This demand persisted and was one of the forces that pushed exploration by sea after a thousand years towards the Spice Isles and Cathay. Naturally, under these conditions, Alexandria situated where the Red Sea trade changed the Mediterranean shipping, became the focus of the Hellenistic activity. Its marble gymnasiums, its ceramics and vessels of onyx and jasper gave a taste of new luxury to Westerners. The first Ptolemy of Egypt had been a writer, or at least had kept journals at Alexandros's bidding, and the Library of Alexandria became the new center of the new research. Geographers recorded new data there. With the natural history of Aristotle, math mathematicians were put to work to design novel apparata. Archimedes settled at that, and to measure the earth itself, to chart the stars in their courses. Eratosthenes came very close to the exact measurement of the earth. Euclid worked out his geometry, not as a theory, but as a useful science. Well, that's what a theory is supposed to be. For nearly a century, the theory or the, the theoria of the elder Greeks were harnessed to human needs. It was a period of vast experimentation. They were not all Greeks at Alexandria. The libraries and students might come from Rhodes or Byzantium or Babylon. Artists tended to do the work of artisans, decorating buildings or wine vessels. Books were copied in great numbers for a reading public, but not limited to a few copies for the study of the initiated. Art itself became public property for a while, for Asiatics demanded that their dwellings be more than a square of stone walls. The influence of the cultured East penetrated further into the West. The works of Aristotle were to be preserved in the main through the translation into Arabic, centuries later when they were neglected in Europe after the decline of Rome. The cold concepts of earlier Greek philosophy were quickened and warmed by Asiatic mysticism. Iranian thought moved men to ponder the meaning of eternity. The influence of the Magi shaped Judaism and Christianity more than Greek concepts were able to do. Well, the priestly structure that had been imposed upon it definitely made possible for Judaism as something that we could possibly identify as Judaism to start appearing in 540 BCE. Alexandros's journey had made men familiar with other religions and had broken down the limitation of their thought Henceforth, although superstition increased, the varied panaceas, such as astrology, were sought after. Men were not so inclined to accept fate as inevitable, except in the darkest west, among Celts, Teutons, and Gauls. A feeling grew that somehow human beings could escape the anger of what some might call gods. Although... Greek was the first language of the Hellenistic revival. And Greek thought had spurred it. The spirit was not Greek, but Eurasian. 
This art seemed stemmed not from the sculptures of the Parthenon, but from the designs of Asia. The splendors of Persepolis had indeed made the journey to the west, and men judged by them new standards. Iranian culture had shaped the Hellenistic world, and Hellenistic culture glorified the Roman world. Upon this heritage, the Romans entered by way of military conquest, building sound roads as they advanced about two centuries after the death of Alexandros, before then a native dynasty, the Parthenon, uh, the, Parth the Parthian, had swept over Iran, Persia. In spite of all their attempts to do so, the Romans never progressed much beyond the Euphrates, the frontier offered by the Reifauch to Alexandros, and the rest of Asia returned to the possession of the Asiatics, the frontier set up between Roman proconsuls and the Parthenian emperors was never cleared away. Growing differences in language and religion made the demarcation sharper. Militant and materialistic Rome fed on the enlightenment of the Eurasian mid-region where, where Rome collapsed in the West through internal deterior uh, through internal deterioration, she survived in the eastern our Byzantine Empire for a millennium, but destroyed the incipient Hellenistic world culture. Since then, until very recent times, there has been no mutual understanding of East and West. Only in the North, where the Macedonians barely penetrated. Russia has, by slow and painful expansion, formed a Eurasian state. Emperors and their titles. They might have had to put that in a little bit different words if this was, you know, like 20 years later, in the 60s or something during the Cold War. Paradoxically, the millions who held Alexandros in their memory gave him no one clear title, but after a century or so, they began to spontaneously call him Alexandros Omegas, Alexander the Great. Perhaps he was the first, if not the only monarch, to be so christened by many nations. And, not by one alone, certainly his personal name was borrowed by diverse lineages thereafter. For we find Alexandros, for we find Alexanders appearing as Balkan kings, Scottish chieftains, Tsars of Russia, and eight popes of Rome. Alexandros had set a pattern that the more powerful Europeans found it difficult to ignore after him, as they conceived it. He had for a few years been absolute ruler of a world state. He had been, in their minds, a conqueror. He had made the world one empire, as they phrased it, a thing he never did. So the man who never held a title, or at least no one title, set the style for the mightiest monarchs after him. Roman emperors, imperator, commander, claimed to be rulers of the world, since Alexandros had believed it possible to unite all peoples. They liked it to be assumed that they had done so. This concept of an emperor ruling mundane peoples by divine authority Later, the phrase became, by God's will, was not lost until modern times. And actually, a lot of cultures had this idea. It was just, didn't quite exist in the West. You know, the ruler of the world idea. I mean, as, as, as a human king that rules the whole earth. Particularly India had it. Augustus, first emperor of the Romans, ordered divine honors to be paid to Alexandros. The Basilius of Byzantium 
held to this shadowy sublimation over all humans. Charlemagne and the latter monarchs of the Holy Roman Empire kept up a tradition of an eastern Ivredenta. Physically in their hand, they, grisp, they grasped the golden globe, or globe of the earth, surmounted by a cross. This was the symbol of their authority and title, if not in fact, they were successors of the earlier earth rulers. Curiously enough, along with this concept of global rule, the mythic bird of the Asiatics, the great winged eagle of the Magi, the bird that flew between mankind on earth and the seat of divinity in the sky, also traveled to Europe by devious ways. It is true that an eagle had been the favorite bird of Zeus and had found a perch in its natural form upon the standards of the Roman legions, which were a kind of regimental totem pole, but the mythical Simurge of Asia, which resembled also a griffin or dragon, served latter Iranians as a symbol of divine power and was so adopted by the Byzantine wearers of the purple. It appeared still faintly resembling a dragon on the banners and shields of monarchs of the Holy Roman Empire, and after that, twin or two-headed or single, it survived in the heraldry, in the heraldry of German emperors, Polish kings, and Tsars of Russia. In a very different way, Alexandros's journey had affected the almost unknown India. The only first-hand accounts of ancient India we have are those of his writers, are the ambassadors of Seleucus, and after his passage, India grew together as an empire of the whole. Among his followers, for a time, was an Indian adventurer, Chandragupta, who took advantage of the upheaval caused by the Macedonian passage to unite the peoples of northern India for the first time. In so doing, Chandragupta paved the way for the empire of the enlightened Asoka, a strange empire, because after 267 BCE, the Buddhist Asoka ruled it by humanitarian measures rather than by military force, which is ultimately more effective. A method unknown to the Western Romans of that age. Asoka gave away treasure, dug irrigation channels, planted medicinal herbs, and in general conducted himself as the agent and not the master of the authority he held. So, Ale so after Alexandros, if not because of him, Asoka in the east and the Stoic Zeno in the west extended their vision to humanity as a whole, cosmopolitan or Buddhist. They reached out towards the same thing. After Alexandros, such concepts had changed. After Alexandros, historians were to make that phrase a point in time. The Legends it was not strange that Asia should remember Alexandros more than any other Westerner, yet it was remarkable that she should remember him as she did, and legends that became the heritage of different peoples, for he endured in the memory of each land in a different way, and each land adopted him as belonging to it. But before the legends took shape, the writers with Alexandros had finished their accounts. His journey had been written up by many eyewitnesses. Callisthenes' story, the Anabasis, had been distorted flattery. But the Lame, the son of Lagas, and the husband king of Thais, had eulogized him for political reasons. So had the writer named Aristobulus. The Arcus had produced a factual record of the voyages. Amiscritus, an epitome of the Amazons and Marvels, those diligent surveyors, and how they must have worked. Baton and Geognitus had turned in a topographical survey. There were other narratives, but all of them, however colored by individual taste, 
seemed to be records of a journey rather than of a man. What Alexandros thought, said, or planned is barely discernible from the fragments that survive today. Most of these journals written in Greek were lost. Only the latter compilations of Roman writers have come down to us entire. For some reason, toward the end of the first century after Christ, well, after Christians put the four historical Jesuses all into one century, but it really stems about 100 CE to like at least 80 BCE. Perhaps because of Roman power, had been moved eastward to the threshold of the Orient, there was a voyage of Alexandros books. Strabo, the first historical geographer and himself a man of the East, drew heavily upon Alexandros's travels. He also followed out the Aristotle Alexandros method of defining the Earth's shape through the course of rivers and mountain chains, which he said was the way to geographize a land. For a while, Strabo worked at Alexandria, consulting Pelopius and other Alexandrian travel tailors. A little after Strabo, the celebrated Ptolemy, the geographer, described the world and its climates. Neither Strabo nor this Ptolemy knew much about Asia farther east than the River of the Sands. Where Alexandros had made one of his about faces, yet the geographies of Pelopius, Strabo, and Ptolemy remained the standard of knowledge until the new age of exploration that began uh, that began with the Portuguese and Spanish voyages across the Atlantic. Of Alexandros himself, Quintus read. Curtius wrote, and the Greek Plutarch, we're going to go into Plutarch in a lot of detail at some point, probably, added Alexandros to his lives, saying in his forward, my design is not to write the histories, but lives. Exploits do not always reveal clearly the virtue or vice of men, but sometimes a phrase or jest informs us better of their character than the most famous sieges, I give most attention to these indications of the souls of men. Last of this group of biographers, Arian Flavius, Arianus, also a Greek by birth and a governor in Asia Minor, wrote the most complete account of the Macedonian's journey, calling it the Anabasis of Alexandros, 